I thought you were offering to hand them out then. Would you mind uh, handing them that. out? <laughs> okay, so uh, firstly, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Um, I'm guessing that's why half of you are still in bed, cuddled up with their loved ones. Uh, just to deal with the uh, mail this year, I've created a online submission form for your Valentine's cards. Um, so you're welcome to drop me a Valentine's card here. Uh, today's gonna be about uh, integrated product development. Um, put your uh, right hand up if you've heard of uh, integrated product development or you've been lectured on it before. Just one of you. Okay, so basically the difference Integrated product development is set apart from what the traditional form of product development is, which is sequential. In other words, you do things in stages. Uh, so the first section today is going to be the difference, or highlighting the difference between sequential product development and integrated product development. We're then going to go on to a, a case study in the second section, uh, some of my work that I, uh, I did in a, a packaging firm. Then we're going to go on to uh, DFX, DFMA, uh, exercises and methods um, and then this inter um, this kind of interlink between the product and the market space in the final section so if you haven't seen it already quite a lot of the inspiration for this lecture is taken from integrated product development book by Moens Andreasen he's kind of the the godfather of integrated product development um, and he's your very own here at DTU so this first section, integrated versus sequential product development. So to demonstrate this, I'm gonna do a small uh, exercise uh, to show the theory behind uh, the improvements that you can, you can gain from doing things in an integrated fashion. So basically the exercise here is you have to use the numbers up there and use the functions just described below it uh, to make the number 25 and you have to use as few of the numbers as possible So just have a little think about that and perhaps somebody can suggest how you may get to the number 25 Using these numbers and these functions with as few numbers as possible Go ahead Four by six plus one. Yep, that'll do Another approach, seven minus two times five is 25, so both using three numbers. So essentially that's the exercise. Um, can you just pass those around as well, Jakob? Um, so in your handouts now, you should have uh, some exercises. The first one, uh, if you can all find it on the first page, or. I'd like you to use the same numbers here with the same functions and firstly to get as close as you can with as few numbers as possible to the number 24. Okay, once you've done that, I'd like you to just cross off the numbers that you've just used from the list. Is everyone following what to do? Anyone? Okay. Then using the numbers that are remaining, so make sure you cross the ones off that you've just used. Using the numbers remaining, try and make the number 12. <coughs> Again, using as few numbers as possible.
Okay, and finally, well, cross off the numbers again that you've used for the second one. And finally, I'd like to get you as close as you can to the number four using the remaining numbers. So did anybody get the number four? No? Was anyone one away from it? And what number do you get? Uh, three. Three, okay. And did you have any spare numbers left over? No. Okay. So the purpose of that first exercise is to show uh, the kind of inefficiencies of sequential product development. And just thinking of this as a metaphor, you may say that the uh, marketing department wants to hit a score of performance characteristics of 24. Uh, they write a specification, use certain numbers, and then pass over the brief to the stylists or the design department, who also have their own uh, goal or target. And they use up a set of other resources and commit another set of constraints and pass it over to the manufacturers and say, this is exactly the product we want. And quite often, the product that they pass over can't be made, or it can be made, but with some inefficiencies. So let's try the exercise again, moving on to the next page. But this time, I'd like you to tackle it in an integrated fashion. So this time, I'd like you to try get 24, 12, and 4 all at the same time, using these numbers only once, but as few numbers as possible. Okay, does anyone think they've got a, a good solution? Anyone like to uh, go ahead? Uh, I have a 4 minus 1 in the classics. Okay. And then I have 6 plus 6, and then I have 4. And how many numbers are you left over with there? I'm left with 1, 7. So you've actually hit all the targets and you still have a number left over. Yes. Has anyone done better than that? How many numbers do you have left over? None. None. Okay, well, this guy wins then because he's used as few numbers as possible. Um, but hopefully this demonstrates to you th the purpose of this exercise, which is to show if you do things in an integrated fashion, it's, it can be far more efficient than doing things in sequence. So small sacrifices um, at each level can uh, lead to a more efficient overall product. Is there any questions regarding that? Okay. So this is essentially the role of the product developer. This is what you people are doing at the moment, creating your business and product, and you're trying to juggle these different requirements of all the different stakeholders involved, whether it be the marketing department, some of the suppliers, uh, the manufacturers, and so on. It's up to you to kind of juggle these requirements. Uh, but does this really apply to product development. So we may ask, uh, this is kind of quite a basic theoretical exercise, these numbers, does it really apply? Um, well, it, it most certainly does. The constraints you impose during your early stage design very much has an impact on all the stakeholders in, the design, uh, in your product development process. Furthermore, product development is incredibly complex. So there are four, far more stakeholders than you may envisage at the beginning. So it's not just those three levels that I showed in that exercise, but there are many other stakeholders which you can produce inefficiencies for in your design. 
And it's made even worse by the fact um, nobody knows how a product is developed. So if you think of any product around you, take this for example, or even a pencil, nobody knows how that entire product is developed. So if you take a pencil, nobody knows how the lead is extracted and refined, uh, how the, the shell or the wood around it is, uh, is formed, how it's uh, assembled, put together, and transported to the customer and sold. Nobody knows how that whole process takes place. So it's very difficult as product developers to, to make all these considerations when you don't know everything that goes behind it. This is one of the most important diagrams uh, for design researchers or, or design practitioners even. It's this difference between the cost and the time. And at the early stages of product development, you won't have used or committed much money. So it doesn't cost a lot to make a drawing. It doesn't cost a lot to do some user studies, these types of things. But as soon as you pass down the design process and you start going into prototyping, you start committing to certain manufacturing and production technology, all of a sudden you start committing more and more cost. So at the early stages, it doesn't cost a great deal. But at the latter stages, you're committing a lot more cost. It kind of makes sense. But the theory of disposition says, unfortunately, at the early stages, you're committing the majority of cost. So it's the decisions that you make at early stages which have the most influence on the overall product cost. So as you get down further towards the end of the process, the decisions you make are fairly inconsequential compared to the overall product. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so we've got a second exercise now. I'd like you to just discuss in your groups. Just consider, if, if you don't want to use your own product that you're developing for your business, just consider something like the iPhone and start listing some of the key stakeholders that you have to design and consider in the production of your product. Now, if you think your product or you don't know it well enough yet, you can use the, the iPhone as an example. And some of the important stakeholders would be the engineering department, they have a big effect and are affected by the product's design. Uh, the users or operators of the design. Um, and shipping and distribution. So you, the way you design the product really does affect its shipping and distribution. So in your groups, have a little brainstorm about some of the other important stakeholders that you need to consider in your design process. Okay, you've got five minutes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Did any groups try this exercise for their own product and business ideas rather than the iPhone? Or you all did it for the iPhone then? Okay. So for your, um, for your particular product, what would you consider to be the biggest or most influenced stakeholder? Sewing experts. The what, sorry? The sewing oh. experts, because okay. a lot of it uh, depends on uh, how sewing is going to be. And, uh, so that's the production side. Yeah. Production yeah. Side. So this, the sewing, um, the actual sewers. Um, anybody else like to give me what their most influential uh, stakeholder is? Computer programmers, yep. I've also written uh, in comparison to what Jacob said uh, two lessons ago, it's about uh, the first buyers, because you're going to have the first buyer. The first buyer, so all the customers. Are there any other um, important stakeholders that haven't been mentioned so far that you've managed to list? I can think of quite a few. Strategical partners or other stakeholders, such as, I mean, is that for your own particular product? Yeah. And what are you thinking? Uh, okay, so the, these might be the retailers who sell the product for you. Yeah. No, we're in collaboration with the to develop the product. You mean? Okay. Oh, I see. 
Okay, so it's a, using the retailer as a different route to market or a different revenue source. Any other important stakeholders? Go ahead. Component suppliers. Sorry? Component suppliers. Suppliers, exactly. Yeah. Uh, is that different programmers, are you thinking? Yeah, well, there's the computer. There's the programmers of the iPhone, and then there are the, the private creators of applications. Okay, yeah. The, maybe some of the, the sub or auxiliary products. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a, a list of a few that I came up with. So, sales and retailing, uh, purchasing, quality control, assembly, disposal manufacturing, suppliers, the legal department, accounting. There's so many different uh, disciplines and uh, uh, stakeholders that you have to consider when you're designing your product. Are there any not listed here that you think are particularly important? Um, that's true. But uh, quality control is usually talking about the uh, quality of production. So it's, it's how many parts per thousand go through which are satisfied. Uh, but also there's the uh, legal regulation side. Um, in other words, is the product allowed on the market at all, whether it meets the quality control or not? Um, you could have marketing as uh, something separate. Some of these are retailing is, is similar to marketing, I guess. Some of them are slight synonyms of each other. But of course, marketing could well be on this list. Okay, and whatever, however many you have on your list, there are probably so many more that you haven't even consider, considered yet, which may actually make your product infeasible. So it may just be one of the stakeholders involved in your product's development and rollout that decides, now this isn't commercially viable for us, or we're not interested in this, which makes your product fail. So you have to make sure you have an extensive list of the stakeholders involved and make sure this venture is interesting for all of those stakeholders. Now, when you put those, um, all those stakeholders, you can line them onto a, um, three key disciplines of integrated product development. So IPD suggests the whole purpose is to create a successful or flourishing business from a need situation. And usually we think the need situation comes from the market. So the idea is uh, you'll find a problem that somebody's experiencing or a market need. But integrated product development says it doesn't just come from the market. You can also have an interesting idea for a product. In fact, a lot of your ideas were product um, orientated. And also, you can have need situations from the production side. So many companies may have um, uh, excessive production capabilities and think, OK, we need to start producing more products to make use of our production lines, or try at least suggest new product ranges so that we can sell more on our production uh, facilities. So integrated product development has these three key disciplines. And the whole point is, you're supposed to always be designing with these three key disciplines in mind. So just to break this down into a bit more detail, some of the stakeholders we just mentioned. On the market level, you'll have marketing, sales, forecasting, user studies. At the product level, you might have design, engineering, aesthetics, ergonomics. Um, and the manufacturing level or production level, you'll have manufacture, assembly, packaging, <coughs> transport, this type of thing. So to give you a, a crude rough definition of what integrated product development is, it's an idealized model of development where the business case of the product is built from the perspectives of all stakeholders. Now we have a, another exercise uh, for you to discuss in your groups. And if you take the key, uh, this key here, the top line refers to the market, the middle line design, and the bottom line production. And I want you to try to place these situations, these business scenarios, onto this key. So to think about which one of these uh, represents each one of uh, these business scenarios. Uh, if that's not clear, 
uh, put your hand up, I'll come and uh, speak to you. Suggest what the answer to the first one is. This one here. Go ahead. Yep, I agree. And the second one. Another group. Go ahead. I agree. And the third one. Yep. The next one, where's the list? Um, I would say so. Our purchase license. Um, so this is where essentially the idea is the uh, product has been developed uh, from outside to a certain degree so they've already established a market product and manufacturing process, and then somebody else has bought the, uh, the deeds or the rights to that product off them. The final one, uh, the second to the last one. Go ahead. Subcontract partner and factory. Exactly. So you may have established your market and your product. You contract out the manufacturer so you don't bother manufacturing the part but maybe you bring it back together to do the assembly for your company so you subcontract out the part manufacturer and the final one is outsourced out design and development so this is perhaps a manufacturing firm that has close contact with their clients um, they realize the clients need a new product but they don't have the capabilities to design it but they have the capabilities to produce it so hopefully this, this will sort of uh, demonstrate to you that there are many different configurations in which you can do product development. Maybe you'll fit into one of these particular roles. Um, maybe you don't have to do all the product development for yourself and you can outsource it out to various partners. We're going to do a similar exercise now but in half the time, just thinking about it in terms of small businesses or individuals. So moving... Uh, Entrepreneurship, the eccentric artist, the innovator, inventor, fabricator, slash assembler, and the business person. So I'll give you two minutes to do this one. Yep. Okay. Someone up, up, give me a well, volunteer and answer for the first one. Go ahead. Uh, business person. Uh, business person, just concerned with the market, doesn't really know what product they need or what production systems. The second, go out of the back. Um, I, anyone got any different to that? Go ahead. Uh, I think that's the, the classic who has their own vision for a product but doesn't really consider either where it's going to situate in the market, whether people really want it or need it, and also doesn't consider the scalability of the production. <laughs> Third one. Uh, the fabricator or assembler. So it doesn't really design the product or um, look at the market, just produces it for somebody. So they'll be taking the manufacturing drawings and just making it or assembling it. This one here. Uh, the inventor. So somebody, <laughs> somebody sat in their garage uh, cobbling something together and then realising, well, actually, it probably, probably doesn't have a market position. Nobody's really going to use that in a real situation. Anyone got a suggestion for this one? Depends which you think are most important. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I say the entrepreneur. And then, only because this course is called Innovation and Product Development, <laughs> I've had to say this one's the inventor. Now, of course, this is not a skill you really need. You don't need to look at each business situation and, and be able to plot it onto these keys. But again, the idea is to enforce that there are these three core disciplines to integrated product development. And some 
companies actually put their business models around these and based on them. Uh, so you could be uh, a fabrication-based company or you could be uh, a business and market development-based company. Uh, any questions regarding those exercises? Okay. Um, I tried to pass around some products earlier. Now I've lost them. Where the hell are they? Oh, they're in my pocket. Um, I'll leave them on the front table, and during the break, you can come take a look. But this is one of the case studies we're going to look at today. Two very simple products essentially providing the same function. You can't see it too well on the board here, but essentially these... Uh, fit into glass bottles and provide a drizzling uh, function for uh, olive oils, balsamic vinegars, sauces, whatever. Um, and they essentially have the same task, but they have quite different uh, outlooks on integrated product development. Um, so you'll be able to see it better down the front here on the physical products. Uh, but here's a slightly more upmarket version. Uh, this is one which is focused on high-end uh, brands. So it has several components. Um, the nozzle, uh, when you open the bottle top, fires out and allows it to have uh, a dip, uh, better reach away from the bottle so it's less messy. You can get the product further away from the bottle and direct it better onto your food. Uh, whereas the other one is the uh, single piece um, little bit easier to make, I guess, but um, doesn't provide quite as good function, but nevertheless, a better function than without it. At the product level, well, this one's relatively complex, several parts, cleaner in operation, easier to direct, so functionally better. Uh, but this is simple, easy to use, less clean in operation. And then at the production level, you could say this one's difficult to manufacture and fiddly to assemble. Remember, these, these are mass-produced products. Um, whereas this is a very simple one-piece moulding which requires no assembly, just insertion. So how do we say which of these products is better? Does anyone, can anyone suggest which of these products is better? Well, obviously you, you can't really unless you consider the product, the production systems and the marketplace. So look at two extreme cases. Here's the, uh, the Philip Stark uh, juicer, the orange juicer. And here's a very simple plastic moulding of an orange juicer which can fit directly onto cups and jars and mugs. And if we consider this one, it's cheaper, quicker, much easier to produce. I would argue on all grounds it's a better product. It provides its functionality much better than this. Uh, it's lighter, sturdier, cheaper, better functioning, has better direction for the juice. But it has no differentiation, market differentiation or wow factor. So although it, it does better on two of the levels of integrated product development, you've got to ask yourself, where does the, the value lie? And in this particular case, all the value was at the market differentiation phase. So think about your own products, think about which ones you have to uh, put most focus on to. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. You think it's harder to clean? Stick it in the dishwasher. Uh, true, I'd, I'd put it in the dishwasher. Okay. <laughs> I'll wash it for you. <laughs> no, okay, yeah, fair point. It may, it may be harder to clean. Um, I would say, though, if you had no respect for styling, product style whatsoever, I think most, well, if you had no respect for styling, who would say that is the better product? Mm, shit. <laughs> okay, if you have no respect for styling, who would say that is the better product? Okay, so neither of you have a clue. Okay. <laughs> well, I would, I would strongly argue that is functionally better. It's much easier to use, it's cheaper, it's lighter, it's more robust. It's not going to crack one of your tiles if you knock it off the, uh, off the desktop. Uh, I think it's an all-round better product. But unfortunately, all the value resides at the market level, the brand differentiation. Do you have any other questions? Okay. I have a comment though. Go ahead. I definitely agree. I think uh, the 
the Philip Stark version is probably the one that's uh, been the most iconic. But it is the one that's been the most iconic. Uh, having said that, I'm pretty sure that the first one is sold in like maybe you know a number that is uh, maybe tenfold or hundredfold or something of the Philip Stark version. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, something that relates to essentially the the designers or the company's uh, so-called pricing strategy. There's another case with a Danish uh, clothing brand, and I'm sure you know it, called Diesel. Many of you probably know it. Um, back in the day, and I'm, when I mean say back in the day, I think it's like five or six years back, they were sort of a medium range clothing company. The, the clothes were rather cheap, a little bit more expensive than H&M, uh, but not as expensive as uh, the more expensive brands. And uh, they figured out that uh, actually people weren't really buying their brand because it was well essentially too cheap. Mm. Uh, other companies were selling their similarly, uh, you know, uh, similar uh, products for for a much higher price. And what Diesel did is essentially they increased their prices with I think maybe fifty percent or something like that. So they got into a different price range and a different well a pricing strategy, and their sales actually went up. <laughs> following that, so that was uh, I think that was what you would call a win-win. Yeah. So, so in many cases, you'll have to think about the pricing strategy of your product. I have to think about okay, are we going to make it really cheap and sell a heck of a lot of them, or are we going to make it, you know, uh, more expensive and uh, maybe have a trade-off, or is it, there actually some synergy to be found between having a you know higher price and actually being able to open up a bigger market? So uh, those things are also very important to consider. Thanks, Jakob. I didn't realise diesel were uh, Danish. I think they are. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's what they did. Okay. They have a Oh, right, okay. Uh, they're part of a franchise. Um, do you have any other questions? Uh, I'm about to bang on for the next half an hour about bottle tops now. So make sure you get some coffee because uh, it's going <laughs> to... It's going to be heavy going. <laughs> uh, if we can make it back by half past, please. Thanks. <laughs>